Take your Bible, turn with me to Psalm chapter 115. Psalm chapter 115. Go to the middle of your Bible and go left about half an inch, and you should be close to there, okay? <laughs> Psalm, Psalm chapter 115. And then uh, keep your finger there, go over to Joshua, Joshua chapter 24. Joshua chapter 24, near the beginning of the Bible. We're going to start with Psalm chapter 115. While you're turning there, I want to give you a short little story. Uh, some of our guys, they go out every week, so winning, knocking on doors. The Lord leads them from house to house, place to place, and meet some wonderful people. One of the stops they did, they knocked on the door, and uh, the guy uh, talked about um, how he started off in Christianity, and uh, now he's into Muslim, uh, Islam, and he says, well, uh, Allah is the same God you worship, but the truth of the matter is, no, he is not. If you look at the characteristics of Islam and, and what they believe, you would understand that uh, the definition or the characteristics of Islam and their, their God line up to the similar characteristics of the devil. They're not the same. My God is different. My God is real. My God is alive. He's ever close to us. And I'm going to share some of those characteristics with you. The title of the message is, A God Who is Worthy. Here in Psalms chapter 115, notice verse 1. Psalm 115, verse 1. Now unto us, O Lord, I'm sorry, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory for thy mercy and thy truth's sake. Now understand something right off the bat. The psalmist is saying, we don't get the glory, you get the glory. And that's the way it is with God. He gets the glory. Um, we serve him, he doesn't serve us. He created us, we didn't create him. Not unto us, O Lord, but unto thy name give glory. Verse 2, wherefore should the heathen say, where is now thy, their God? But our God is in heaven, in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he pleased. Now he's talking about the other gods. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. They, they that make them are like unto them, so is everyone that trusteth in them. In other words, your God can't do anything for you, and you can't do anything either. Boy, I can accomplish a lot in life because my God can do anything. Amen? All right, verse 8. Uh, verse, uh, verse 8. They that make them are, are like unto them, so is everyone that trusteth in them. O Israel! Trust thou in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. Ye that fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. He says it three times. The Lord hath been mindful of us. That means he thinks about us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless them that fear the Lord, both small and great. The Lord shall increase you more and more, you and your children. Now, that's a God that I want right there. He wants to bless me. He wants me to trust him. He can do the impossible. Verse 16, the heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth hath he given to the children of man. He put us in charge of it. The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence, but we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Father, in the name of the blood of Jesus Christ, I beg for the filling of your Holy Spirit. I ask that your Holy Spirit reach into our hearts and our lives. Grow us in you, Lord. Make us strong in Jesus Christ. Father, help us to know your word and be able to stand on it. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. I used to be a missionary in the country of uh, Uganda, East Africa. I've seen all kinds of different religions, all kinds of different gods. I've spoken to many types of people. I've been into Dubai. I've been to different parts of the world. And I've seen the different things that people worship. And let me say this. The God of the Bible is the God of the universe. Our God, the God that I serve, can do anything. And we are the ones that make a difference. I told you, when I went over to Uganda to get my uh, paper signed, to get permission to go there, I had to get NGO paper signed. I went to the place called Tororo. I met the, the mayor and the township people. And they said, well, we've already got all these religions here. We don't need any more. We don't need any more religion. What our people need, morals, integrity, discipline, and character. Isn't that true? Morals, integrity, discipline, and character. That's what people need. 
There's different religions that cannot give that to people. They give them a religion, but they can't give them character. They can't give them morals. They can't give them integrity. But my God can do that. He can take the low and put them in the place of a prince. That's what my God can do. And yours can too if you're, he's your God. And so anyways, when I went there, I told them, I says, listen, I didn't come here to bring a religion. I came to gave them a relationship with the God of the Bible, a relationship with Jesus Christ. They signed my papers. I came back, got my support, went to Uganda two weeks before we had to go because of the terrorists. They came to me, the same people, people came to me, and they said, you're the only ones that made a difference. Why is that? I gave them the God of the Bible. These people saw that God can help them. He's real. He listens to them. He speaks to them. He hears them. He helps them. He saves them. He provides for them. They saw it with their own eyes. They experienced a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the kind of God we serve. He wants to help. He wants to exalt you and your children. He wants to be that kind of God to you. He ever liveth, Jesus ever liveth to make intercession. Go with me to Joshua chapter 24. Now there's amazing difference between what a person says that he believes about God and what they really practice. We're so pr prone to leave and go off into the ways of the world and do the things of the world and forget about God and be consumed with our habits, our hobbies, and our friends and everything else to where we forget about God. And next thing we know, it, we're living, living in a world that spins and we're in a tizzy. And then we realize, hey, we need God. He's always there. He can take good and make it better. He can make, take bad and make it good. God can do that. Here in Joshua, Joshua took the children of Israel. He was with them in Egypt. From Egypt, he went through the 40 years in the wilderness with Moses and the children of Israel, and he saw a whole lot. And Moses died, and he took them into the promised land. They fought the battles together. They set up their places where they're going to live, their dwelling places. The people came to him for advice, and he gives them advice. He's about ready to pass off the scene, and he tells them to follow God. Then he says this in verse 15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, why would it seem that way? Oh, he's too strict. I hate legalism. God's, it's not a legalistic God. He gives us rules and safeguards to follow. As a parent, I gave my kids rules to live by because I loved them. If it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Those are all capitals. That's Jehovah God. That's not Allah. That's not the gods, false gods of the world. That's Jehovah God, the God whom we serve, the God that gave us his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. Our God can do anything that we need him to do. Have you ever noticed that those that follow other gods, Allah, Baal, whatever, false gods, their gods... The followers attack those that disbelieve. They attack the infidel. They hurt other people. Our God doesn't do that. My God can defend himself. He can do that. All right? But here's his people. God brought Israel out of Egypt. He cared for them for 40 years in the wilderness. And now they're finally on the other side in the promised land. And Joshua warns them. He had seen how quick people turned away from God. Uh, and follow the, the false idols of the world. And he had seen it over and over again. And he cries out to them, you choose who you're going to serve. And it is an individual choice what we make. I had to choose that if I'm going to follow Jesus Christ or if I'm not going to. And I chose to do that. I chose in my life to live by faith for the just shall live by faith. I chose that. I chose to exercise my faith and let my faith grow in Him. When we went through the hard times in our life, I chose to obey God even when things didn't make sense. The Bible says, I don't understand it, but I'm going to trust God. I had to choose that. And so you must do the same thing as well. He tells them in verse 29, And Joshua said unto the people, Ye cannot serve the Lord. For he is an holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive their transgressions nor their sins. You say, preacher, what, why is he saying this? How come you can't serve the God? For he's holy. He's warning them. Folks, you're too close. You're too quick to wander. 
You're too quick to go back to the ways of the world and serve the idols of the world. And he was right. As soon as he died, they start wandering. They started going back to the ways of the world. He knew what kind of people that we all are. It's in our flesh. He explained that the Lord is holy. God is holy. Think about what holiness means. Pure, righteous. It's not one of those gods where you go to church and like you hear today, come as you are. You see people going into church and they kick back their, their uh, they got their soda pop in their hand and they lean back in the theater seats and put their feet on the, on the pew in front of them and they're drinking while the rock band's going on. That's not church. My God's holy. The music that's played in church ought to be a holy music that brings glory to him. Remember verse 1 in Psalm 115? Not glory to me. Not that pleases my flesh, but that brings honor and glory to him. You see, it's not a come as you are. What I saw, let me tell you this in Africa. Sometimes those people put us to shame. They live from one day to the next, to the next. They may eat only one meal a day. If they're blessed, they can have two meals a day, which is corn, maize, flour. They boil the water, put it in there, and make it into a goo. They pick the goo up, put it into a little broth, and eat it that way. That's a blessing for them. But here they are. They believe in God. They'll come to church. They'll accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. They know it's different from the Charismatics, from the Catholic, from all the others. They see the differences. They feel the difference. And when they come to church, you know what they do? They put on their best. I've, this, is, this is funny. I've seen the ladies. They may have one dress. Saturday, we go uh, on evangelism. We'll go from each hut, each village, and the ladies are washing their dresses, and they're laying them over the butt bush, and that's the only dress that they have. Guys, they'll come to church. They'll have their suit coat on. They'll have their white shirt on. They'll have their tie on. They have their shorts and flip-flops on. <laughs> hey, that's the best they have. Praise God for it. They're giving God their best because they're reverencing him. They're holding up him up here and trying to glorify him with uh, the best they can. Some people want a God that will let them do whatever they want. I don't want a God like that. I want a God that knows what's best for me. Because I don't have all the answers and neither do you. And sometimes he'll tell me things that I don't like to hear, but he knows it's what's best for me. I may not understand it, I may not agree with it, but what I've learned through time is his ways are higher than my ways and his thoughts and my th thoughts, and he's always right. And I can trust him. And three times he calls out for the people, trust him. People of Israel, trust him. People of Aaron, trust him. All ye that fear the Lord, trust him. Trust him. He calls out for us to do that. People want a God that cannot defend himself. I'm telling you what, my God can defend himself. He can take care of it. People want a God that enables them to hurt and kill other people and control them. My God says, listen, I've liberated you to be free. Follow me now. I'll make you fishers of men. I'll make you kings and princes and priests and all, and all the land that ye dwell. See, he liberates us. He frees us. But all, more than that, our God is holy. He's holy. He's just. He says in verse 20, if ye forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then he will turn and do you hurt and consume you after that he hath done you good. He says what he's saying is God's done you good. He's done so many marvelous things to whom much is given, much is required. He's brought them out of slavery in Egypt and he's brought them into the promised land and gave them lands and riches and houses and things, a land flowing with milk and honey. And if you turn from me, after all that I've done, all the miracles that you've seen, he says, I'm going to chastise you. I'm going to teach you a lesson so that you turn back. He's good. He's worthy to follow. Let, let me um, let's see here. I'm going to skip some here. Back in Psalm 115, go back over there real quick. Verse 2. The writer shows a comparison between the real God of heaven from the gods and the idols that men worship. Notice what he says in verse 2. Wherefore, why should the heathen say? Why should they say? Where is now their God? 
Why would they say such things? Why would an unsaved man says, where's your God? They can mock. They can say things all that they want. You see, my God's near to me. As I follow him and as I serve him, he's got a plan and a purpose in my life. And it's only for good. His will for my life is perfect. It's perfect for me. And it's going to bless me. It's going to bless my wife. It's going to bless my children. It's going to be satisfying. It's going to provide for all of my needs. As I follow him, he's going to do that. The only time people would say, where's your God, is if I'm not following him. If I'm not serving him. We do turn away from time to time. We do get ourselves in trouble. But why should they say that? They would only say that when we turn away from them. But the people, look down at verse 4 through 8. We see that they worship false gods. Let's give some facts about their false gods. If Psalm chapter 115, verse 4, it says, Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. They that make them are like unto them, so is everyone that trusteth in them. You say, well, why would they follow that? They do. They do. I was in Afri- While I was in Africa, we had somebody come to our, our uh, church one day. He came a couple weeks in a row. He heard the gospel one service, and as he heard it, he accepted Jesus Christ as a Savior. He kept coming back, and one day he asked us to come with him to his village, and he says, we have several false idols in our church, in our, in our village, and I'd like for you to come and pray with me, and let's get rid of them. I said, okay. And so when we went there, they had a hut that had collapsed, and God destroyed it. All kinds of clay stuff in there, their false idols, and it was all destroyed. And we went to one place, one corner of their village, and there was this tall cactus. And I'm standing there in front of the cactus, all right, where's your false idol? That's it. And I'm thinking, the cactus? That's a false idol? And I've got to be careful so I don't humiliate him. I'm trying not to. But I'm shocked. Who would work worship a stupid cactus? You know, but they did. We cut it down, chopped it up a little bit, poured kerosene on it. Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray that you have this thing to burn. Now, it's full of water, so we had to soak it several times, and finally it did burn. He took us to another place in the village. We go over there. And there's a stick in the ground, and he says, there's another one. And I'm thinking, what do you say to a stick in the ground? That's kind of stupid. Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, would you burn that stick, a false idol, and and make it perish? Poured kerosene on it, burned it. Took us to another place in the village, and uh, there's this little stick house that they had. and And I said, well, what do you do with that thing? It's about yay high, about a foot and a half. Well, after each meal, we, we bring a plate of food. We take from it first, and we put the food in there, and we come back, and then we eat together, and then the next day the food's gone. Yeah, the dogs came and ate it, you know. But anyways, we did the same thing to that. People worship stupid things, but we do too. That new Camaro, <laughs> it's got pep, it's got speed, but boy, is it beautiful. Nothing wrong with having one unless you worship it. But he's talking about the idols that people make from precious metals and stones and everything. He points out that they are the work of men's hands. We create them how we want them to be. Well, what good is that to us? How do they affect us? How, how do they, oh, yeah, that's right, they please us. But they do nothing for us. And then we find that people bow down to them and pray for them, pray to them. Elijah used that with uh, the uh, prophets of Baal. You know, they, they, they worship a false god that's out there somewhere that can't do anything for them. Well, maybe your god is sleeping. Maybe he doesn't hear. But when he prayed, wow, the fire came down from heaven. Can your god do anything for you? I know mine can. He can help me in those tough times. I've seen him do miraculous things. They can't talk to you. They can't touch you. 
They can't get close to you. They can't hear you. The, the things you cook for them, they can't smell the sweet odor of it. They can't come to you because they have no feet. They're just false gods. They're worthless. And so are the people that create them, and so are the people that worship them. They don't have a life. They don't have a God that can be there in that great time of need when your child is dying. There's been times in our life when our children, when we're in Uganda, and my wife and I had to take turns staying up all night. You couldn't drive to the hospital at night. You get out there, Kampala is four and a half hours away. You get out there, you're going to be robbed. They're going to put up roadblocks. They're going to rob you and kill you and whatever else. You don't travel at night. We prayed through the night. We took turns sleeping and staying up with our children that were deathly ill. And then the next morning, as soon as daylight broke, we shot to the hospital praying, God, keep Joel alive. God, help him. And we get to the hospital, and there's somebody. God brings another man of God there, and he just happens to be there. He says, let me pray with you. And and he puts his hand on our child, and he's praying with us for our child's life. We go in there, and they put the IVs in, and God just spared our son. God's done that for me. He's done that for others. Has he done that for you? God is good. He can do the impossible. He can hear my prayers. He can see my afflictions. He can come in, in that time of help. Here, let me help you. Let me hold your hand with my hand and walk you through life. He can do that. Let me put my arm around you and help you through this. Here, I'll even pick you up and carry you through this storm. My God can do that. How about yours? My God's good. What about some facts about the one true God? He is the creator. We see in Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God. He always was, is, and will be. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Not this evolution garbage that you hear that they can't prove. God created the heavens and the earth. Colossians 1.17, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for God because we didn't create him. He created us. He is faithful to his creation. Psalm 119.90, Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. Thou hast established the earth and abideth, and it abideth. Because he made it, therefore it abides. Not only that, but he cares for you. Here in 1 Peter 5.7, it says, Casting all your cares upon him, for he cares about you. Me? He cares about me? Yes, he does. Even the little things that I'm going through right now that nobody else knows, yes, He cares for you. Nobody else does. God cares for you. He says, therefore, cast all your cares upon Him. Go to Him in prayer and say, Lord, there's a need that I have. Nobody will help me. Nobody's there for me. But Lord, will you help me? He cares for you. He can do that. Cast all your cares upon Him. He gives us Good things. First Peter chapter, uh, I already did that one. Uh, Psalms 37, 25. He says, I have been young and now am old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed seeking bread or begging for bread. God can take care of you. He can give you good things and he wants to. Hebrews 7, 24, we see that he's able to save you and always help you. He says, but this man becometh, is talking about Jesus Christ, he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood, wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Then it goes on to say, for such an high priest, Jesus Christ became us, who is holy, and notice this next word, harmless harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. That's our God. He's not that mean God that's out there to hurt, destroy, and, and all that. He loves you. And so much so that he gave his son Jesus Christ to come and die on the cross for you. He's just. He's love. He's merciful. He's full of grace. And he cares for you. He has the power to do what he says because he's God. Let's look back to our passage in Psalm 115. Look at verse 3. He says, But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. Now take your Bible. 
Keep your finger here. Go with me to Revelations chapter 4. People say, well, I don't understand. What is it like in heaven? What is this throne room like? You know, he's in heaven. God is alive. He's real. His throne's in heaven. Our God is in the heavens. Psalm 66, 1 says, Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Then John tells us what God revealed to him about God in his throne room. Revelations chapter 4, let's begin with verse 2. The last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 4. It says, And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven. And one sat on the throne, and he that sat was like, uh, was to look upon like uh, a jasper and sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne, and the sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, that's twenty-four seats, and upon their heads crowns of gold. Oh, I'm sorry. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. I love this. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. What a beautiful picture of the throne room of God. He's up in heaven. The earth is his footstool. He's, he sees you from, from his seat. He's talking about the throne. You go in there. It's beautiful. It's glorious. You see the throne there, and above the throne is that rainbow. You know what that is? Remember in the book of Genesis where God destroyed the world with a flood because all the man was wicked, and only Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He destroyed all the wickedness uh, of man. They knew better. These people knew Adam who walked with God in, in the garden. They chose to turn away from God. Well, he destroyed the earth with a flood, and then he put his bow in the clouds, the rainbow. For an ever reminder to man and to God that he'll never destroy the world again with the flood. And here we see the rainbow over his throne. And it talks about the rainbow there. And then this talks about the uh, 24 seats where the elder seat. He's got people there with him. People is going to help him as he gives assignments to rule and, uh, and to issue out uh, commands and stuff. Then he talks about the seven burning lamps, the seven spirits that he sends out before him. He talks about the beast with eyes before and behind so he can see everything, everywhere. But then he talks about before the throne, that sea of glass like unto crystal. Crystal, you can see through it. That sea of glass like unto crystal, right there at the footstool of the throne, where God can look down on man with the earth being the footstool. And he can see you in that dark corner of your room praying and crying and pouring out your tears to God and begging for the salvation of your child, your son, your daughter, your mom and your dad. Or going through that crisis, uh, you can't pay the rent, you need this and you need that. And you're crying out to God because of something happened in your life, a tragedy that took place or whatever. And God on his throne can see through that sea of crystal Looking at you, he can hear you because he has ears to hear. He has eyes to see and arms that he can reach out and help. And he can put his hand on your shoulder and bless you. That's the God we have. What a beautiful picture that we have here. We have a great God that can be there in that time of need. I want you to turn to another passage here. In chapter Psalms, Psalm, I'm sorry, Psalms chapter 73. My God can do anything. In Psalm 115, verse 3, it says that God can do whatsoever he pleases. That tells me something about my God. My God has a will. He has a will. There's people out there that think they have to kill the infidel. They have to do, serve their God and destroy people. Why? My God can do it if he wants to. He doesn't need me to carry out dirty deeds or whatever. My God can work on people's hearts. He can change people. He would prefer to save them first. When I die, I'm going to heaven. But if they die, they're going to hell. God, I was an infidel one day. Then I got saved and became a saint. So did you. So my God can take care of that. He can take care of people. People are so worried about, about uh, uh, people who don't serve God. 
If God tells us in Romans chapter 12, verse 19, that vengeance is his, he'll repay, saith the Lord. Let him deal with the infidel. He dealt with me. Instead of giving me what I deserve, he gave me salvation, what I don't deserve. My God did that. Here in Psalm chapter 73, we see what God, how uh, a person, the psalmist here, he was troubled. He was troubled at the wicked. It seemed like they, they could do wrong and get away with it and get away with it. And he says, this is, this is too much for me. This is too painful. Look with me, verse 3. He says, for I was envied at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no bands in their death. There's nothing stopping them. But their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore, because of this, pride compassed them about as a chain. Violence covered them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore his people returneth hither, and the waters of a full cup are wrung out on, uh, to them. And they say, How doth God know? And is their knowledge in the most high, high? They're mocking God. Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. He, what he's saying, this is, he's describing the wicked that are around him. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> He says, this plagues me. How can they do these things and get away with it? How, they, how can they do wrong and, and, be, uh, and enrich their lives? He says, I'm plagued with this every single day. It bothered him. It bothered him because nothing happened to them. He tells us what changed his thinking. Look down at verse 16. He says, when I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. It bothered him. Then he says, verse 17, until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then understood I their end. Oh, surely thou dost set them in slippery places. Thou casteth them down in destruction. How are they brought into desolation? As in a moment, they are utterly consumed with terrors. My friend, the wicked aren't going to get away with anything. They'll destroy. They'll rape. They'll kill. They'll do things that are wrong. But God is just. He'll give them space for repentance. He wants to turn them away from that. He wants them to repent. He wants them to turn to Christ. And if they don't, they're in slippery places. When judgment comes, it's going to come fast. It's going to come hard. See, God's just. I don't need to worry about them. All I need to worry about is following God and pleasing Him. All throughout the Bible, throughout the Bible, we see God's justice. He doesn't need my help. How does God work on man and change him? He does it through many ways. One, he does it through love. We love him because he first loved us. The Bible says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God's love gave us a gift. His Son, Jesus Christ, came from heaven, was born of the virgin, lived his life, fulfilled all of the law, and he died in your place and in my place. He paid for our sin debt for us. And all you've got to do is accept that free gift. That spiritual birth that Jesus was talking about in the same chapter in verses 3, he was talking to Nicodemus and says, unless you're born again, you'll not see the kingdom of heaven. And Nicodemus says, born again. Do I go back into my mother's uh, womb and, and come back out and born that way? He says, no, no, no. That's not what I'm talking about. That which is flesh is flesh. That's what we are. But that which is spirit is spirit. Marvel not, I say you must be born again. You have to have a spiritual birth. You've got to be born of the spirit where you acknowledge to God, I am a sinner. But Jesus Christ came, that free gift, verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in the name should not perish, but have everlasting life. When you accept that free gift, that's where the spiritual birth comes from. He explained that to these people. So he works through his love. He works through his word, the word of God. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is quick. That means it's alive. It's living. It's perfect. As it was good 2,000 years ago, it's still good today. It's never outdated because it's God's word. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of asunder of soul and spirit and, a, 
and of the joints and the marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. See, the Word of God can do a job that I cannot do. The unsaved, the ungodly, the wicked, the infidel, which I used to be, just like everybody else. The Word of God reached me when nobody else could. The Word of God got deep into my heart. It cut. It slew me. It pointed out my true motives. Terry, you're lying. You know that. You're trying to deceive them. And you're the one that's wrong. You know that. And it just pricked me. And I said, you're right. You're right. And when I finally humbled myself, I accepted Christ. And my life changed because of the spiritual birth. He works through His Word. He works through His Holy Spirit. Uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 4, and it says, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak as the Spirit gave them utterance. They went out preaching the Word of God. The same Word that changed my life is the same Word that changed other people's lives. The Word of God does it. Do you have the Spirit of God in, in you? God changes man through salvation in Jesus Christ. John three thirty six. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth in him. 1 John 5, 12, He that hath the Son hath life. He hath, that hath not the Son of God hath not life. First, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. When you hath the Son of God, when you have life, when you've accepted Christ into your heart, I'm not talking about a religious experience. I'm talking about being born again into the family of God where you've acknowledged God. I'm a sinner. Jesus died for me, and I accept that free gift. You meant it with all your heart, and you told God that spiritual birth comes into you, and the Bible says He changes you from the inside out. He makes you a brand new creature, a brand new creation in Jesus Christ. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. You become a new creature, a new person. The past is a past. All of your future is right before you. You now become a child of God through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's a brand new beginning. Well, but what about those things you've done in the past? They're all forgiven. What about the bad things you do now? I go to my Father in heaven and say, forgive me. Do you lose your salvation? No. See, I don't want to disappoint Him. I want to please Him because I've seen what He's done for me. I want to bring glory to His name because He's a real God. He's worth serving. He's worth following. And he is, His will is that you and I trust Him three times. In one passage, in Psalm 115, he says, House of Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. House of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. Ye that fear the Lord, you and me, trust in the Lord. He is our help and our shield. Do you love him? Can you trust him? Will you let him be your help? Will you let him be your shield? He wants to be. We've got a God that doesn't change. We've got to have a God that loves, a God that has given us His Word, a God that has given us His Spirit, a God that has given us His own Son. He's got hands where He can reach down and help. He's got eyes that He can see. He's got ears that He can hear. He's got nose that He can smell. And He's got a will for you and for me. He's good. He says, will you trust me? Will you follow me? We accept me. Let's pray.